This will be a message on the meaning of Jesus's ascension from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. This is a sermon by me. I'm Dr. Joe Sprinkle. Let's begin by reading the text from the English Standard Version. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were uh, looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking to heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, this is the account of the ascension of Jesus Christ. Everybody knows about the story of the death and resurrection of Jesus. We celebrate Jesus's resurrection every Easter. But not so much gets said about uh, the event of this passage, the ascension of Jesus. According to the Bible, 40 days after Jesus was resurrected, and uh, during which time he appeared many times uh, to the disciples, uh, according to Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, after that he ascended into heaven, and now, as the creed says, sits at the right hand of God the Father our Almighty, from which whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. That's from the Apostles' Creed. The Nicene Creed says something very similar. This is recorded both here in Acts, in verse 9 of Acts 1. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. It's also recorded in Luke chapter 24, 50 through 52. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually in the temple, praising God. Now, what I'm going to argue about in uh, this passage, what I'm going to argue is that the ascension of Jesus conveys important theological truths and introduces uh, what the transitional period of the church age is going to be like. And so let's start by looking at uh, the important theological truths that the ascension teaches us about Jesus himself. The ascension of Jesus teaches us in particular, about the exaltation of Jesus, the authority of Jesus, the intercession of Jesus, and looking up to Jesus. First of all, the exaltation of Jesus. Theologians often speak of the two uh, states of Christ, the humiliation of Christ and the exaltation of Christ. And I'm borrowing this from theologian Wayne Grudem in his Systematic Theology. Uh, the state of humiliation includes four aspects of his work. His incarnation, that is his becoming flesh or becoming man, even though he was God in heaven, he, he was humiliated in becoming a human being. He's also humiliated by his suffering, by his death, and by his burial. Those four things represent the humiliation of Christ. 
The state of exaltation also includes four aspects of his work his resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, as we see in this passage, his session at the right hand of God, and his return in glory and power. So the ascension of Jesus is a part of his exaltation, and the New Testament recognizes this. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, that God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And the ascension was a visible, symbolic uh, uh, demonstration that God was exalting Jesus Christ to the highest place. Paul also speaks in 1 Timothy 3.16 that he was taken up in glory. And Peter in Acts chapter 2 adds that Jesus was, quote, exalted at the right hand of God. So the ascension of Jesus uh, symbolizes his exaltation. The ascension of Jesus also symbolizes the authority of Jesus. Jesus, upon his ascension, was seated at the right hand of God, the position of honor and authority under the authority of God the Father. The Messiah, anticipated by the Old Testament, was to sit at God's right hand in that position of authority and to have authority in particular over everything, including all his enemies. That verse is Psalm 110 and verse 1 that mentions that. Uh, there, David, speaking of his greater son, the Messiah, the Lord, or Yahweh, says to my Lord, the Messiah, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Psalm 110 and verse 1. The writer of Hebrews picks up on this statement. In uh, Hebrews chapter 1, where he says, after uh, he, Christ, had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. And then he goes on to say in verse 13, to which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? And so the writer of Hebrews draws on this verse in Psalm 110 and verse 1 and applies it to Jesus Christ, uh, who uh, uh, provided uh, purification for sin and is given that position of authority at God's right hand. And then one other verse in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 uh, Paul says that he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is uh, invoked, not only in the present age, but in the one to come. And so by ascending into heaven and being seated at God's right hand, that uh, symbolize Jesus's authority over all rule and authority and power and dominion. He is the supreme ruler of the world. He received glory and honor and now rules with authority over the entire universe. Third, the ascension of Jesus puts him in a, a, a position to intercede for us with the Father. At the ascension, Christ as high priest presented the blood of his atoning sacrifice before God, and he continually intercedes for us even beyond that in uh, defending our case as our advocate before God. Romans 8 verse 34 mentions this, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. If we have become Christians, 
and uh, the blood of Christ applies to us, well, we need not worry about being condemned by God because God, on the basis of that atoning sacrifice, has forgiven our sin, and Christ, who has presented the blood of his own uh, sacrifice, his own blood before God as uh, the offering for sin, uh, has, as our advocate, interceded for us, and we don't need to worry about condemnation uh, from, uh, from God the Father. The writer of Hebrews says something similar in Hebrews chapter 8, uh, verses 1 and 2. Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, and who serves in the sanctuary of the true tabernacle set up by the Lord and not by mere, a mere human being. And again, uh, it will go on to talk about how in that heavenly tabernacle, Christ has presented his own blood and has interceded for us, making it possible for us to have a right relationship with God. So Jesus' ascension has put him in a position to intercede uh, with us, uh, with the Father. And then fourthly, Jesus' ascension calls us to ethical living by calling us to look to heaven where Jesus is. Since you have been raised with Christ, Paul says in Colossians 3.1, Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Jesus' ascension calls us to look up to heaven, to live even on earth by heaven's standards. And uh, because uh, Christ has... Uh, gone up into heaven and we look up to him, it has given us the ability, even in this world, to live by heaven's standards as we uh, uh, set our hearts on things above. That'll affect how we live on earth. So those are all ways in which Jesus's ascension teaches us about Jesus about his exaltation, his authority, his intercession, and uh, the call for us to look up to him as a ethical standard. But Jesus's ascension also foreshadows his return. At the beginning, uh, there was a question about uh, when the kingdom comes. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. But then in verse 11, it says, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The visible ascension of Jesus into heaven tells us how Jesus will come back. Jesus ascended into heaven in a bodily way. Jesus will return in a bodily way. Jesus ascended into heaven in a visible way. Jesus will return from heaven at the second coming also in a visible way. More than this, just as Jesus's resurrection foreshadows our resurrection, so Jesus's ascension into heaven foreshadows our being taken up into heaven when we meet the Lord in the air. And this meeting the Lord in the air is uh, referred to in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, that's the second coming, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, 
will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so that we will always be with the Lord. And so it's the ascension of Jesus foreshadows Jesus' second coming, but it also is a foreshadowing of our meeting him in the air, the way he was lifted up into heaven uh, as well. John chapter 14, verse 3 and 4 goes along with this uh, theme as well. Uh, there it says, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you to be with me, uh, that you also may be where I am. Uh, you know the place uh, where I am going. And so when Christ returns, he's prepared a place for us, and he'll take us to be with himself. And initially, at least, that'll be uh, being taken up uh, into heaven to be with Christ. This also foreshadows our ruling with Christ. Just as Jesus' resurrection corresponds to our being raised in newness of life, and Jesus' ascension corresponds to the exaltation of Christians by God, uh, the ascension to Jesus to God's right hand foreshadows our being put at Christ's right hand and given certain uh, authority to rule over uh, aspects of creation. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, uh, where it says, uh, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ. In other words, already we are positionally seated with Christ in heaven, who has given us authority to some degree to overcome the spiritual forces of, of evil. Ultimately, we will rule with Christ, Revelation 3 and verse 21, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. And indeed, in a couple of chapters later, uh, in Revelation uh, uh, chapter 5, it speaks about how Christians will rule on the earth. And so we are given uh, a foreshadowing of what we will experience when we meet the Lord in the air and are given the position at the right hand of Christ and will rule under his authority. Now, when the disciples asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? It wasn't clear that they understood that there was going to be a second coming, but we know uh, from the subsequent answer that th this fullness of God's kingdom uh, would not come until the second coming. The, the kingdom of God came in one sense at the first coming, uh, when the king of the kingdom, Christ, came. And Christ's uh, kingdom exists now in the fact that Christ rules in the hearts of believers. But uh, the fullness of that kingdom that they ask about awaits the second coming. And so they ask, you know, Lord, are you going to at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Um, but the answer is, well, no, uh, that awaits a future time. But it's interesting that uh, they were not given a complete answer to that question. What they were told, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Why is it that the time of Christ's return is not revealed? And I'd suggest uh, three possible explanations. One, it is not proper for us to know the times and the seasons. Indeed, according to Mark chapter 13 and verse 32, uh, Christ, in speaking of the second coming, says, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven know 
nor the Son, but only the Father. It was not proper even for angels to know precisely the time of the second coming. And in a deep mystery concerning the workings of the Trinity, not even Jesus himself, at least in the incarnation, knew the day or the hour of his own return. Much less is it proper for us mere humans to have that knowledge. What is proper for us is to wait in hope and to be witnesses in the meantime. But as for knowing the day and the hour, it is not proper for us to know. It's not, uh, uh, not for you to know the times and the seasons. But moreover than that, it's not even possible for us to know the times and the seasons Winston Churchill said a very wise thing. I said at one, at, at one point in his life, he said, it is a mistake to look too far ahead. The chain of destiny can only be grasped one link at a time. In our life, uh, it's difficult to know what the future is going to bring. I mean, who would have guessed the great pandemic was going to come uh, a year and a half ago that has so affected our lives in the last 12 months. While God through prophets reveals that there will be a second coming, and he does give us some details around what will happen at the time of this, that second coming, a time of trouble, an antichrist figure, he gives us insufficient data to calculate when it will happen. It's simply not possible for us to know the times and the seasons. And there have been those who have made predictions as to when Christ will return, calculating by various criteria as they saw fit. And they've uh, come up with dates in the 1840s and 1988 and uh, the year 1000 and various dates. And they've all been wrong because it is not possible for us to know the time or the season. Uh, it's uh, uh, a futile thing to attempt to predict exactly when Christ will come. We're just not able to know. Moreover than that, it's not even good for us to know the times and the seasons as far as the second coming is, is concerned. It's not only improper for us to know some things in the future, and it's uh, impossible for us to know them, it's not even good. Some things are simply better left unknown until they happen. For example, some years ago, my wife and I took a trip to Yellowstone National Park, a great trip. Uh, we went with the other family members, had beautiful scenery, amazing wildlife, geothermal features. Uh, but the day that we got back to Rochester, Minnesota, where we were living at the time, my wife missed a step on the stairs, fell down, and broke her ankle. She ended up in a cast for two months, and it was months afterwards before she had fully recovered. Now, if we had known the future, if we had known that this was going to happen as soon as we got back from our vacation, it would have been... Uh, um, an unfortunate thing because it would have run the pleasure that we had on that trip. It was better for us not to know that this was going to happen. It's not always good for us to know the future times and seasons. Well, the same is true with the second coming. If we knew that the second coming was decades or centuries away, as it was destined to be the case for most Christians throughout uh, church history, we would have been tempted to go to sleep. But if we uh, think it is at least possible that Christ will come in our lifetimes, in any generation, uh, perhaps uh, even at any moment, um, well, then we will live our lives in such a way so that he will be pleased with us if he were to come. 
or as it says in Mark 13 and verse 33, uh, regarding the second coming, it says, be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. So far, we've learned that uh, the ascension teaches us theological truths about Christ. The ascension foreshadows the second coming of Christ. And now the third and final point that I want to make about this passage is that it teaches us that between the ascension and the second coming, we have the power of God's spirit to give witness. Again, let me read some of the relevant verses here. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons uh, that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In between the ascension and the second coming, God has given us his spirit to empower us to live in the present. And that event, by the way, is recorded in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came upon the church. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. What kind of power? It was not the kind of political power that the disciples had asked about in verse 6, but rather a supernatural power, the power that comes from the Spirit of God, the power that opened the eyes of the blind and the hearts of unbelievers, the power that raised the dead, the power that comes from God himself. This is the power promised to those that wait on God and allow themselves to be filled with God's Spirit. Scripture teaches that all Christians are indwelt by God's Spirit. It's a source of power, a power that uh, lives in you and abides in you. But what kind of power is it? A power to do what? Well, in the context of this uh, passage, is the power to be a witness to the gospel, both in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The disciples will be able to preach the word and witness to the authority of God's saving gospel, and it includes the power to understand and explain the word of God and to experience God in a fuller way. Now, are we not powerful in ourselves? Well, no, we lack the power within ourselves to be the most effective witnesses of Christ. After all, we are finite creatures. We are weak creatures. And at least speaking for myself, at times we are cowardly creatures. But when the Holy Spirit came upon the early church, it became an unstoppable force that turned the Roman Empire on its ear. When we allow God to work in us, allow him to fill us, then we can have the power to be more effective witnesses too. A person filled with God's Spirit will have the courage and zeal and insight to do that. Now, God, uh, Paul actually commands us in uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8 to be filled with the Spirit. Now, all of us are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but we need also to be filled with the Spirit. Well, how is it that we can get filled with the, the Spirit to get more of him in our, our lives? And it looks like there's at least a couple of ways that, that could be done. One is to pray for it. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 31, we have an example of this. Uh, when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So as they prayed, perhaps even praying for God's Spirit to fill them, 
uh, they were filled with the Spirit. Acts chapter 5 and verse 32 suggests obedience is a way to get filled with the Spirit. And uh, there it says, and we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. As we pray for the Spirit, as we obey what God has commanded us, we can expect God to fill us with his Spirit. And so when uh, Jesus redirected the uh, disciples to uh, not towards the exact time of the second coming, but towards being filled with the Spirit, um, he uh, was encouraging them to that spiritual power of being a witness for him. Being a witness, indeed, will foster the growth of God's kingdom that they would like to see come now, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 has rightly uh, been called a key uh, verse uh, in this book. Jesus gives the central theme of the book of uh, witnessing by the Holy Spirit to ever-widening areas of witness. Uh, so the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Judea and in all uh, uh, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Uh, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. An ever widening area of witness is envisioned here. First of all, in Judea, in Jerusalem, and if you look at the book of Acts, it's actually, uh, uh, you can outline the book of Acts around uh, this verse. Uh, chapters 1 through 7 emphasizes what happened to uh, the disciples of Jesus immediately after the resurrection in Jerusalem. But then in chapters 8 through 12, it tells the story of how the gospel spread throughout all Judea and Samaria. And then in chapters 13 through 38, it also expands it to the ends of the earth. Now, in the end of the book of Acts, ends of the earth is uh, Paul in, ending up in Rome under house arrest is how the book ends in uh, chapter 28 and verse uh, 31. But uh, there's no reason to think that this is limited just going to Rome. Uh, ends of the earth is a... Uh, open-ended ministry throughout the entire world. The program of the church is mission, and that's the last thing that Jesus said before he ascended into heaven. Uh, he told them that they were to make disciples of the nations and that they were to be witnesses of him uh, to the ends of the earth. And as we apply this to ourselves, well, we don't live in Jerusalem, but uh, our Jerusalem would be our present location. Whatever hometown that you live in, whatever the region around your town would be, that would be for you, your Jerusalem. But then uh, a broader than that would be Judea and Samaria. Well, that would be uh, the state around uh, where you live. Uh, and then to the ends of the earth would be uh, everywhere, all throughout the world. The bottom line is this, that we are to be, uh, uh, the mission of the church is to send the gospel throughout the world. And we can divide this up into goers, senders, and the disobedient. Some of us are goers. These are the ones who will go out to the mission field to preach the gospel. Uh, they're the missionaries. They, they do the cross-cultural thing. Uh, others of us uh, can be uh, senders. Jesus recognized that uh, some, who are not, uh, some are not going to be sent out into the mission field. Uh, but uh, what's the mission of those that stay? Uh, well, their mission is to provide support for those 
that go. Uh, we can see that in the biblical command to send in uh, Romans chapter uh, 10, verses 14 and 15, where it says, how can they preach unless they are sent? <clears throat> well, some have to stay in order to send others who will go. And so sending or supporting is a vital part of the missionary enterprise. Without senders, the Great Commission cannot be fulfilled. But if you're not a goer or a sender, then unfortunately, I would have to say that you are in the category of being disobedient. Whether you are on the field or here at home, your mission is to contribute to the spread of the gospel. And uh, if you're not doing that, you're disobeying the very last thing that Jesus told his church uh, before he ascended into heaven. So some Christians are called to go other places to witness to the uh, gospel of Christ. If you're good at evangelistic witnessing, you might consider going into the ministry or becoming a full-time missionary. But that said, uh, even the Christians that stay at home are to be missionaries in some fashion, in the sense that we're all to go out and to speak Christ to those around us and assist those uh, who cross cultural boundaries to do that. So how shall we conclude? The ascension of Jesus is a part of the exaltation of, of Jesus, symbolic of his power, showing his position to intercede for us and his, uh, showing him to serve as a ethical guide for us believers. The ascension of Jesus also foreshadows Jesus's return in our meeting the Lord in the air at the second coming, at which point we will rule with Christ. We don't know exactly when Jesus will return to establish his kingdom, uh, but we know that it will. But then between the ascension and the second coming, uh, we are to fulfill our mission of being God's witnesses with the help and power of the Holy Spirit to spread God's kingdom throughout the world through by preaching the gospel. We have God's Spirit to help us uh, accomplish that goal. So let us seek to make the passion of the Spirit the passion of our heart. We're not perfect. No doubt we'll stumble and make mistakes as we attempt to, uh, to, to witness for Christ. But through the Spirit of God, it is possible. We need to learn to be witnesses of Christ in all that we say and do. And may God help us to do just that. So this is my message on the meaning of Jesus's ascension from Acts chapter 1, uh, verses uh, 6 through 11. And my name is Dr. Joe Sprinkle.